Good morning. Sunday mornings better when we actually obey the word of God and we do love and encourage and spur each other on. And as I told you before, there's no day during the week where you get more hugs than today. And so keep hugging on each other, keep loving each other, and keep being Christ to one another. <coughs> and I tried to give you as many hugs as I could, and for those who I missed, just see me after worship service. I'll give you a hug. And I get kisses from all the old ladies. I know. But they're the prettiest ones in the congregation. So I'm the luckiest man here. I want to say something. It matters. It matters that you're alive. It matters. It matters how you treat people. It matters. It matters what you make the purpose of your life. It matters. You know, one of the things as a minister, one of the things that I deal with on a constant basis is dealing with people who are not just struggling spiritually, that's struggling emotionally. You know, that's one of the things I deal with on a weekly basis. Because as you know, we all live life. We know life happens. We know different things go on. And everyone has something going on in their life that they need encouragement and prayer and love. So all those things matter. And one of the things when people are de detailing their emotions, one of the things that I hear is sometimes they just say, well, sometimes it just doesn't seem like anything matters anymore. It doesn't seem that I matter anymore. Does anyone know? Does anyone care? I mean, what's the point of all this? Is any, if I wake up and I do this or that, does it really make a difference? Does it even matter? The answer is it does. It matters. Because oftentimes we'll wake up thinking, I'm just going to do what I usually do every day. It's not going to matter. But one of the things that we know is any action done in the name of Jesus Christ, matters. Every kind word that you say during the day matters. The smile that you may even give a stranger matters. You know, sometimes we don't think that, and sometimes we can belittle our lives and what we accomplish and what we do. And it's so common because one of the things is, I'm not a natural encourager, but I made it my goal in life to try to always make people realize who God made them to be and to feel better about themselves after some interaction with me. Because I believe scripture teaches that. But one of the things that I try to help people to realize is you matter and what you do matters. Because so oftentimes we don't feel that way. You know, people often ask me, if you, if you come to my house, my man cave is kind of set up as a little bit of a theater room, a little bit, and I, I watch a lot of kids' movies with my kids, you know. And, but people often ask, what is your favorite movie? And I'm going to tell you, this is my favorite movie of all time. It's a Wonderful Life. It's my favorite movie of all time, and people think, and I, I remember watching this with a young kid once, and they're like, but it's so old, there's not even color there. And I was like, well, it's the good story. And I love this story, this story in this movie because I know in talking with people, all of us can relate to the characters. 
we can all relate to George Bailey. Because there have been times where we think, you know, I have all these hopes and aspirations and dreams, and then life happened, and they didn't come true. Does life matter? Or, I'm the honorable one. I send my brother off to college. I take care of my mom. I help poor people get homes. I'm trying to do the honorable thing. Take care of my dad's business. And I'm doing all the right things, but bad things are happening to me. And less good moral people are being blessed above me. Does it even matter? And he gets to the point where he then gets himself in this tragedy. And he's on a bridge and he's contemplating suicide. And he's thinking about jumping off that bridge. And then the angel comes and he talks with them. And... Uh, and one of the comments he makes is, he says, I wish I'd never been born. And you know what? I've heard a lot of people in my ministry life say that. I wish I'd never been born. No one would have cared. No one would have noticed. What difference does it make? It makes all the difference in the world. You know, one of the things that I've realized, because I study people a lot, so, yes, you guys are on my test subjects. But is I, I hear people and I listen to people's stories and I often ask, what are some of the significant times where people built you up? And do you know what's really interesting? A lot of them weren't these grand scheme things, these big monumental moments. It was a time where they said, you know what, there was a time where I sat in a restaurant with my friend and my friend just listened and built me up that day. And that happened 20 years ago. And it's like, who would have thought that just a simple meal, listening and talking, could have been a turning point in someone else's life? It's actually one of the reasons why I try to make it my practice on a weekly basis to maybe try to take someone out and just talk with them and encourage them and listen to them. But people all often will relate to George Bailey and say, well, what, matter, or what difference does it make? But we see at the end of the movie, it does. And in fact, he sees what would have happened if I wasn't born? What would have happened if I didn't do what I did? What would have happened if my sacrifice says, didn't make a difference? What would have happened if I didn't do the right moral thing? And he saw the tragedy of what one life looks like when it's absent. That's why every day matters. Because that is a day that the Lord gave you to bring Him glory. It was an extra day that the Lord decided to put air in your lungs in order to bless the person next to you and not just yourself. And the thing is, when we are like that George Bailey, we can think, well, why does it even matter? But then at the end of the story, his brother comes and he says, you are the richest man in town. And he didn't mean financially because George was poor but because he was rich in deeds. He was rich in love. And because of his sacrifices, the whole community was blessed. And then when he was in need, everyone else came to his aid. Even his nursemaid said, you know, I've been saving for a long time and I can't think of a better way to give this money up that I've been saving for than to help out George. And I think about that and I think, that's what each one of your lives means. You know, I look out and I'm staring at all of you. And I can think that every, our congregation would be radically different if you weren't a part of it, doing what you're doing in the name of Jesus Christ. So it matters. Now, as a minister, one of the things that I have to do is I do funerals. And in my ministry life, I've done funerals where there have been lots of people. Overflow. And I've been to funerals where the only ones there were the kids. And the only reason why the kids were there was that they could figure out what they would get. Because that's the kind of people they were. Because they didn't bless anyone. And so I want to ask you the question, what if you didn't exist? What if you had that George Bailey moment? How would life be affected? 
How would the world be affected? How would the church be affected? How would your family be affected? You know, one of the things that I always get, and it happens every single time, is at the end of people's lives, I'll talk with them, and one of the things I always, not sometimes, always hear, is they say, I wish I would have done X, Y, and Z more in life. It usually includes spiritual matters, doing, being good to other people, more forgiveness, and things like that. Generosity, kindness, time with family, time with church. Every single time. And I remember every time I have one of those experiences, I keep telling myself, don't, Micah, don't wait till you're old and dying to live out what they're teaching you. Do it today. Do it today. You who are teenagers, take advantage of the lessons and don't waste your whole life living what the world tells you to live. Live as God wants you today. That way you have a whole lifetime of doing what everyone else wishes they would have had a lifetime doing. You youth have a huge impact, an opportunity to live life the right way, the biblical way. You know, what would happen if you died? Who would show up? What would they say about you? Did you know there was a lady who, you know, most of us when we die, we won't know what people say about us, but did you know there's a person in the Bible who died, but she probably got to hear a little bit about what people said about her after she died. And when she died, it affected the church. And when she died, people were sad and grieved because of who she was in Christ and what she had done in the name of Christ. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 9. And in Acts chapter 9, we're going to read about this woman named Tabitha. And she was one who, was no, who made her life count. You know, the sermon title is talking about making your life count with service. And this is exactly what Tabitha did. And look at the response of her death. You know, some people are going to die and no, one are gonna, no one's going to care or notice. And then there's other people where there's overflows. And people often ask, what's the difference? The difference is the number of people who loved you because of who you are and what you did. But let's read this. In Acts chapter 9, verse 36 through 43, it says, In Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek her name is Dorcas. And she was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time she became sick and died and her baby was washed and placed in the upstairs, body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lida was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lida, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. Peter went with them and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. And Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. So here is a woman who died, and guess what? The church is shaken up. And this was a good woman. Her life counted. Lives were touched. God was glorified. I mean, that, that is the kind of person when they pass away, the whole church is just sad and grieved because they loved that person. Her life counted. So how can we make our life count? How can we be a people that are just like Tabitha? How can we live out each day saying, God gave me today for his will and his purpose? How can I make it so that at the end of my life, I don't live with any more regrets? I say, God, I had done what you had want me to do, and that is to honor you with my service. I honored you with my life. 
I was that living sacrifice. I gave, and I gave of myself and my heart to the point where lives are touched. How can we make our lives count even more? Because tomorrow you have a choice of how you wake up and you choose to live. Are you going to live to honor yourself or are you going to live for something bigger than yourself? Namely, God the Creator and His will which impacts and affects and influences people for eternity. How can we live that way? You know, one of the things that Tabitha was known for was she was being known for doing good. At the end of your life or when you pass away, are people going to look at you and say, that person was known for doing good? Tabitha wasn't a pew sitter. She was someone who went and she helped the poor. Do you know what a characteristic is of people who are known for doing good is? They don't wait for needs to arise to do good. They're the people who are eagerly looking and scouting out ways to actually do good. Because here's the thing. Are there needs in the world? Yes. Are there always going to be needs in the world? Yes. Are people hurting in this world? Yes. And because of those things, we know there is always good to be done. And in fact, as Christians, we are called to do that. That's why we are called to not be weary in doing good. There's a reason why the Petersons and the Millers are inspiring and teaching our kids to go to work camp to do what? Good. To think of people outside of themselves and realize there's a greater calling and purpose in life than building up a bank account and having pleasure for yourself. There's something that makes a difference so that at the end of your life, you can live without regrets and people will say, that person was good and that person did good. I mean, how are you going to be remembered? You know, people in history are often known for either their actions of goodness or their actions of evil. That, there's usually that dichotomy there. How are you going to be remembered? You know, I was kind of inspired by a woman by the name of Stacy Bess. Stacy Bess was a young lady who made some mistakes as a young teenage girl. She got pregnant early on. She married the man who she got pregnant with. And it took her years to finally become a school teacher in Utah. And so she finally got her teaching credential and she could not get a job anywhere because she was older than all the other graduates because it took her longer to get her college degree. But then she went to the school district and they said, okay, we have one position open that no one wants. Do you want it? And she didn't know what it was. So she said, yeah, I'll take it. And, she, and they told her, you're going to be teaching from kindergarten to sixth grade all in one classroom. And so she's like, okay. And so she prepared and she did all the things that a teacher would do. She was hopeful and thinking what a classroom would look like. But what her classroom was, was not a classroom that we would think of today. And in fact, her school didn't have a name or a principal or a custodian. She was the sole person at her facility. Where she went was a homeless shelter where she taught homeless children. And the reason why her school had no name and no principal was because they were thinking they were transient students who would be in and out and there would be no way to record them, no way to teach them. And in fact, in the past, they were just trying to meet state and federal law and so they put on a TV and put in a tape and call the kids and say, watch the TV. It's the only way. But this woman said, that's not acceptable to me. So she worked with the homeless set in the shelter and she realized, I'm not teaching K through 6, I'm teaching K through 12. She got no support, no money. And her and her husband sacrificed a lot of their funds to repaint a room. To buy desks because they didn't have desks. To buy books because they didn't have books. And you know what? She won all sorts of awards. And she inspired and changed the lives of these kids who were homeless. Kids who had no shot in life because of bad choices by some of their parents or some parents who just fell on hard times. Kids who would be forgotten. They literally went to the school with no name. 
But that name would have a new name because she decided to do good. And I can tell you, every one of those kids is going to remember Miss Bess, the one adult person who actually cared about my life and where I was going. Are we a people that's known for being doing good? I mean, Tabitha was. She helped the poor and they showed the clothes and they probably figured, you know what? She made this for that guy sitting on the corner over there. Or this person came to Christ because of her kindness. I don't know what kind of stories they told, but the whole church was shook up. So much so that they called a leader, an apostle in the church to come. But are we like Tabitha? Are we like Stacy saying, I want to be known for doing good, and not just doing good, but good in the name of Jesus Christ for his will, his glory, his praise. I mean, we have the choice to choose to live life selfishly or selflessly. But the ones who live selflessly are the ones who are called good and remembered for their goodness. You have the opportunity to not have to wait till the end of your life to say, I should have. Use the moment that today that God has given you. Be known for doing good. Another reason why, why Tabitha was known was because she was known for being a giver. You know, she was known for helping the poor. She was kind. She was compassionate. She was generous. And not only did she give of her funds, she gave her time. She gave her energy. But probably most of all, she gave her heart. Are you known as a giver? You know, in life, two people are often classified as either a giver or a taker in life. And do you know what the world teaches? If you, they say, to be happy in life, be a taker. And take all you can and take from other people. Take even at the expense of other people. Take, take, take. But we know, in following God, we know from the story of Tabitha that when you're known for being a giver, it makes a huge difference. Do people remember the gifts that you have given them? The time that you've shared with them? the sacrifice, the energy, but even most of all, the heart. You know, I have a friend. I would go to his house on a weekly basis. And you go to his house, and he and his mother, um, the, his, he takes care of his mother, would show me some holes in his wood floors and in his carpets. And he'd be like, why do you randomly have holes in your carpets? And it's because when his father became a Christian as an adult, he became very zealous and mission-oriented. And he said, you know what? We are now having brothers and sisters in Christ in Africa who are becoming Christians, and they're establishing churches, but they, don't, they have a hard time taking the Lord's Supper. So their family would gather up money, and they would buy materials to make lightweight plastic communion trays. And when they were making them, the first time they started making them, they were like, hey, let's make trays for the, our African brothers and sisters. They wanted to give. They wanted to sacrifice. And so they were just excited. They were zealous. And they were putting down all the materials. And they had all the uh, tools. And they were ma making holes for all the communion cups. But when they realized... The, you know, the women came into the house. They're like, what are you doing? They're like, we're making communion trays. They're like, not on my floors. And they pulled up the communion trays, and there's holes all over the floors. But you know what? A lot of people would be upset about that. But they thought those are just symbols of the fact that we were giving to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And it just excited me to hear that they would be willing to give like that. And even though his father passed away when I was ministering in Moses' leg, his wife would still come up to me if there was a need and says, I don't have a lot, but can I contribute $20 here? I don't have a lot, but can I go and visit that person there? And that kind of it was encouraging and inspiring. And this man that I didn't know, but I knew his son, he's remembered as a giver. Are you remembered as a giver or a taker? Because people are going to think of you in one of those two ways. That's how we view people. Do I want to give my time and attention to that person? Is that just a taker? Or am I glad to be around that person because that person's a giver? 
Tabitha was a giver. She looked at the poor and said, you know what? God put me on this earth for a reason, and maybe that per reason is to help the poor. What's your purpose in life? Are you a giver? And what can you give? You don't have to be a millionaire to give. Did God give you a heart? Because if he did, and he gave you a new heart, then give that away. And one of the other ways that we are known is be known for being loved. You know, this is why sometimes funerals for me are sometimes really, you know, joyful and celebratory or sometimes really depressing. Because you could tell whether or not someone was really loved. I know Lynn has done way more funerals than me, and he probably knows as well when someone was, someone who was really loved or someone people tolerated. Our goal is to be loved. And someone, people, and that is one of our greatest needs. Our great, one of our greatest needs is to be loved. All of us want to be loved. All of us need to be loved. We're made in the image of God who is love. So naturally, we're going to draw towards people loving us. But people often ask the question, and I get asked this question in counseling situations, how can I get people to love me? Do you know what my answer is? Spend more time loving them. You know, so, sometimes we spend so much time trying to love ourselves, we do what the Bible says not to be, lovers of self. We're saying, love me, love me. How come you're not loving me? How come you're not loving me? Love me. Love me because I am me. That's not, that's not how to go about being loved. The people who are sincerely and truly loved are the ones who aren't thinking about themselves, and they, they're just loved because they love you. That's why, if you ever notice, you know, a lot, a lot of times when you guys call or email or when I post something, I'll say, I love you guys, because I want you guys to know you're loved. You're loved by God, you're loved by the church, you're loved by your elders, you're loved by your minister. You're loved. You are loved. And I want, I want to be loved. You want to be loved. That's why we're called by Christ to love each other. But are we known for being loved? Because the best way to be known for being loved is to be a lover of other people. When you wake up in the morning, you should always ask yourself the question, who can I love today, and how can I show them that, lo that I love them? You know, I, I once went, went somewhere, and I was guest preaching, and I was telling someone, and I gave a guy a hug, and I said, I love you, and he was like, weird. And I said, don't worry, I'm married. But I was thinking, you know, I'm not a natural hugger. To tell you the truth, it took a lot for me to start hugging people. I'm one of those people where I'm like, slap your hand away. Um, but, but I started doing it more because I, I want people to know, and I don't know everyone how they like to be shown love, but I want to try to show love in every possible way because I want them to know God loves you. And he put me on this earth to help you know that you're loved. So when I give you a hug, imagine that being God giving you a hug. When I give you a word of encouragement, imagine God giving you a word of encouragement. I'm the, I am and you are the physical manifestation of a spirit of love. A God of love. Are we known for being lovers of people? Lovers of each other? Because that would change things up completely. Tabitha loved people, and people loved her. And I know so many of you are saying, I want to be loved, and I'll be the first to tell you I love you. But if you want to grow in being loved, love other people. Don't wait till tomorrow. Wait, do it today. When we leave, make sure you tell a few people you love them, because those are probably the words they want to hear and need to hear before you, they leave this church building. And during this week, your kids will need to hear that you love them. Your kids need to hear, your parents need to hear their kids say, I love you. Kids, all you teenagers and young people, make sure you tell your parents, 
that you love them. Because they too need to hear from you. So let me ask you, are we going to be a church that makes our lives count? Are we going to be a church that are going to say, you're the richest people on, in town, not because of monetary reasons, but because of love? Are people going to remember you like Tabitha was remembered? Today is the day to serve. Today is the day to be loved. It is the day to be the church that God has called us to be. The people who make their lives count with goodness and generosity and love. Let's commit to being those people. And if today you need to be loved, and if today you want to experience a greater fullness of God's love by making the choice to become a Christian, repenting and being baptized for the forgiveness of your sin so that he can love you for eternity and for, your church, for this church to love you for eternity, we want to offer you the opportunity to come forward and do that now as we stand and sing. Do so.